bigger sets that you're on, obviously, uh, with things like Guardians of the Galaxy, X-Men, for instance, there's probably a lot of special effects that are going to go on. There might be rain machines, wind machines. How are you, how are you dealing with those, those kind of things? Collaborating with the special effects department. One thing that I've noticed, and, and, you know, and I want to shout this from the rooftops, these big special effects movies, the US studio pictures, there has been a shift in a, a shift in what directors expect and there has been a, a huge shift in the support for production sound over the last 10 years. Um, I think that when we first started doing big special effects superhero movies, the sound technology was just on the cusp of changing. We didn't, you know, we didn't have 16 tracks at that point. We didn't necessarily have really, really high quality radio mics. You know, we had radio mics whose range we couldn't quite depend on. Um, we had Lavalier, excuse me, we had Lavaliers which uh, which didn't sound great like DPAs. Um, and so I think there was a culture. Um, just give me a moment. I think that there was a culture 10, 10, 15 years ago on these big movies where directors and producers kind of knew, look, we've got wind machines, we've got rain machines, you know, they, the sound department, you know, they're not going to be able to get this. But here's the thing, through the outstanding work of my peers and colleagues, all of the other sound mixers around the world, uh, you know, Peter Devlin, Jeff Wexler, um, you know, uh, Chris Munro, uh, you know, all of these guys who have done just such fantastic work, what they've done with the, with, with, with the new technology is, and the directors that they work with, they have, um, they've given a, they've given directors confidence in production sound. And what I'm finding now when I arrive, like when I arrived with James Gunn on Guardians, he was 100% behind me and I had his support, but he wasn't, he wasn't expecting to loop anything, you know. He, 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 you know, comedy dialogue, which goes back to me saying, do you remember at the beginning I spoke about the comic strip, yeah, about the strip. how I learned instantly that that comedy, that moment, that spark on set might not be recreated for a second take, let alone in an ADR studio, right? <laughs> James Gunn knew that, okay, and he also knew that he could have confidence in this sound department because he knew, you know, directors have started moving away from going, let's just loop it. They, they, they are, they've worked out that that's not going to be so good for them. Of course, there's some, there's some scenes in every movie where you're going to have to loop, and when you're pushed into that kind of situation, there's nothing that anyone can do. But what I'm very, very careful of is that when there is something that can be done through collaboration and very very careful planning that it is done and that starts um, that starts with uh, with collaboration with the special effects department it starts with going to the special effects uh, uh, designer and saying look the director's given me a job he tells me that he doesn't want to loop this scene that you're designing with these with these uh, this this rain machine and this wind machine you know have you got a system to make it quiet? If you haven't, can I give you my perspective or perhaps tell you about something that I've used before? You know, I don't want to tread on your toes and tell me if it's not possible, but have you considered doing this? And it's just about negotiation and about collaboration. And this becomes a very, very important skill. And again, that's not down to anything. That's, you get that through experience and being through, through seeing different situations. For instance, the silent wind that, that we developed with Matthew Vaughan, you know, my, my career has, has, has been greatly uh, supported by Matthew Vaughan, the director, and we worked out silent wind on Stardust, and Matthew said, look, I, I, I want to work, do this scene on green screen, and I've got to have wind in their hair, but I don't want to loop one word of it, so work it out. And then he said to his special effects designer, listen, Simon has been told that I don't want to loop this, <laughs> So please work closely with him. And what we designed was we put the wind machines outside the studio. Um, we brought them in on air conditioning ducts. The ducts were flexible hoses, okay, um, with a kind of probably, let's say, a, a 12 or 16-inch diameter, okay. So they're big, fat hoses. Each hose, okay, was held by a special effects technician and would follow an actor, and each actor had their own hose. 
Okay, and so that's how we did it. And on the wide shot, by the way, where you can't get the hose anywhere near them, right? We would say, okay, it's so wide that the dialogue editor, and by the way, Danny Sheehan, the dialogue editor, had already been told about this. Right, on these big wide shots, you're not going to have the, the lip sync issue. We're going to run the big wind machines. The dialogue's going to be unusable. But when we get in tight, the moment we're into even a mid shot, we're going to get the hoses in, and you'll be able to drop in that dialogue onto the wide shot. And by the way, we're only going to hold the wide shot for a couple of lines of dialogue before we cut into mid and tight. You know, and so it's just that kind of thought process and collaboration. You know, when, you know, I think I've told this story a few times, but for those guys who haven't seen any of the stuff of me talking about Les Mis, let's talk about Samantha Bach singing on my own, walking down Rue de Plume um, in the rain. You know, that was a situation where we basically, we did a rehearsal and the rests um, pointing straight up. I couldn't do a downward facing DPA. I had to point it straight up because of the costume. And so, you know, the raindrops were big and they were dropping on the DPA and I could hear the rain dropping on the right coat. And so one of the things that we did after the rehearsal was I went to the DP and the director and I said, Tom, look, I'm in trouble here. I don't think I can get this. And Tom Hooper, being Tom Hooper, said, you absolutely have to get it. There's no ifs and buts about it, Simon. Let's work out how to do it now. Um, you know, they're, they're, we, we, with Tom, again, a very single-minded individual, if he wants the performance, he's going to get the performance. And so, um, and so he came over and gave me support, and uh, and we said to the DP, "Look, we need to make this rain quieter." And the DP said, "Well, okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to look through the camera, and I'm actually going to roll the camera so I can see it through the shutter. Let's get the the special effects supervisor um, on the radio, and let's have them make go from bigger drops down to a fine mist." And he said, "And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it through the camera." And the moment that rain doesn't read on the camera, we're going to have to go a little bit, we're going to have to go into slightly bigger drops. And so he turned the drops down from big drops to medium drops to medium small drops until it became a mist. And at that point when it became a mist, he said, look, it does, just give me a second. Yeah. He, said, um, he said, look, it doesn't give me, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't read on the camera anymore. So let's go 1% up on that, so let's go back up slightly, oh, we can read it now, and that's the level. So we knew that the rain on that scene was as light mist as it could possibly be, yet still read on the camera. And then what we did, that's only Sam singing on her own, so we only need one boom, right? So the second boom, we attached a lighting flag to, okay, mm -hmm. and that worked above the first boom. So you've got the first boom there, and you've got the second boom holding a lighting flag as a roof above the first boom to stop that mist landing on the back of the Rycoat windjammer so I couldn't hear the rain hitting the mic. Um, and actually, in that, in that scene of Sam Bark singing, it's 100% boom. The DPA didn't sound as good as the boom on that occasion. The boom was a sharp super seamit, which again was great. Was the process signal, which again was uh, was great at getting rid of the uh, getting rid of the raindrops hitting all of the rooftops and everything, and just homed in on her dialogue. And we also we had every single piece of carpet and hogs hair covering every hard surface around that set to make sure that uh, to ma to make sure that we couldn't. Um, that we couldn't hear the raindrops hitting the hard surfaces. And as we were steady camming up that road, there were runners and sound trainees stepping in, okay, as soon as they could at given points in the steady cam move and putting bits of hog hair in to surfaces that had been hard because they were in shot and then sliding in the hog's hair very quietly so that that hard surface um, gets softened so we can't hear the raindrops hitting it. Fantastic. So it, you know, it's all about collaborating, and for collaboration, you need the, the director on your side, and you need the DP on your side, and you need the special effects designer on your side, um, and you need to start very early on building those relationships.